Welcome to the VO School podcast, dedicated to the art, craft, and business of voiceover. Each week builds upon the last to give you a comprehensive understanding of a career in VO. My name's Jamie Muffet. I'm a full-time voice talent and audio engineer, and I'll be joined by some of the industry's top professionals on both sides of the microphone to drill down and dig up the truth. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the VO School podcast. And today is the first in a new series that's going to be happening, I don't know, every six to eight weeks or so. And it's called Ask Jim. Now, you know Jim from previous episodes of the podcast, Jim Kennelly from Lotus Productions. And I'm going to be reaching out to you, the listeners, the community, to present questions to Jim. And I did that just the other day. And today, our episode is him answering them. So this is Ask Jim Volume 1. Now, before we get to that, the usual bits of housekeeping. If you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can find all of the links at our website, voschoolpodcast.com. And a new and exciting development that I keep banging on about, but it really, really will help us to continue making this, is Patreon. So please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash VO school. And you can join the community and slowly but surely we're going to be building that up. And I'm going to be adding a lot more content to that that isn't available anywhere else. And I'm primarily looking at extra content for the podcast. So an additional podcast every month of stuff that no one else gets to hear. But also I'm going to be putting up tutorial videos for using DAWs and processing and production as well as some performance stuff as well so please sign up to Patreon that will really help us out and you'll be getting some additional content too okay so that's all of that out the way so we're going to have a couple of quick ads and then we're going to get straight into Ask Jim Volume 1 Connect your studio to the world with IPDTL. IPDTL is a cost-effective alternative to ISDN without the need for hardware or line rental. Connect, mix, and record up to four locations at the same time, including phone patch, right from your computer. You don't need additional software as IPDTL runs in your browser, and you can even get your own ISDN number. Try a day pass for just $15 or subscribe monthly or yearly. So, for directed sessions, interviews, and of course, podcasts, choose IPDTL. The National Zoo. (laughs) Because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins. And these are just a few examples of the first class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the demo production tab to find out more. All right, so today we are joined again by Jim Kennelly, and Jim is, I mean, what's your job role, Jim? It's kind of varied. A little bit. Uh, of course, I'm very happy to be here with Jamie again on uh, VoiceOver School podcast. It's great. Uh, we here at Lotus Productions, my company in New York City, we cast, direct, and produce voiceovers every day on every platform, and we hire talents all around the world. Yes, you do. And it's great. I love coming into Lotus. Um, so... Before we begin, I want to talk about how we're connecting, and I'm very pleased to announce that we have a new sponsor for the podcast, and it's IPDTL, and that is how we're connecting now. So, Jim, I know that you use IPDTL pretty much every day, so why don't you talk about how you use it and a little bit about what it is, if you don't mind? Sure thing. Uh, IPDTL is a a way that we connect with talents and uh, producers uh, globally. We're able to send an individual link, a hyperlink, to either a talent, and then we can record them in our studio and patch in or also send another link to our producer, and he or she, they can direct, and they can hear perfectly, just like you're hearing our conversation between Jamie and I right now, the client and the talent can hear each other in a nice, clear way. Uh, We're able to record the audio on our end, and then, of course, work with it and create uh, the spots or the narrations, whatever we're up to. So it's a... It's a very easy-to-use device that makes connectivity really simple. 
Yeah, and it's done through a browser, isn't it? So as long mm-hmm. as you've got a browser and an internet connection, you're, you're ready to go. You don't need any hardware or anything like that. Correct. Uh, the interface is very easy for our clients, the producers, to mm. see for the very first time and make use of. And it's had a very positive reaction uh, for our clients. And I also know for individual talents, it gives them a chance to say like, hey, here's some new technology that's very simple to use. They send it to their clients, the producer, the writer, the directors, and they, all of a sudden there's this in, instant connection. They hear each other perfectly, and it just makes the communications in the session so much simpler, and I think rewarding. Yeah, and with the very slow demise of <laughs> ISDN, this is mm-hmm. becoming more popular, would you say? Oh, yeah, much more popular. We use mm-hmm. it with our, certainly we do use it a lot with our clients in Europe and in, uh, in Asia. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing an increase used here in the United States as well, particularly yeah. in uh, political advertising. We're using it a lot more oh. in political advertising. Yeah. Oh, cool. And you can combine ISDN and phone and uh, other different connections into the one session, can't you? So yes, if correct. someone, if you've got IS, if you've got IPDTL and someone asks you to connect via ISDN, you can do that through ISDN, which is really cool. Uh, through IPDTL, sorry, which is really cool. So right, I made it. They've made it uh, very simple for. You know, there are a few different uh, formats that people use to connect between studios and talents, mm. and IBTTL has created a way that they can all be bridged together. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, great. Right, so let's get on to some questions. Sounds good. Now, you just explained there a little while ago about what you do at Lotus every day, and there's, you know, you do a lot of very nuanced things, of course, but um, the two big sides, I think this is fair to say, are casting and also producing. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Every day, every every hour. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to get to sort of both sides of those, and maybe there will also be some crossover as well um, today. I should say that today is going to be questions from our listeners and a few from me, so this should be fun. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So everyone's looking to up their game and give themselves a competitive advantage. So... Beyond nailing the specs, are there any other characteristics that will sway your decision as to choosing one talent over another? So maybe their studio is great, or they're great to work with, or they get back to you quickly, or they're good at taking direction, things like that. You know, how much of those other characteristics come into play? Right. I I think it's very important, uh, particularly now from 2017, coming into 2018, and looking forward in the voiceover business as we head towards 2020 and beyond, that Anything you can do to eliminate a hurdle to hiring you improves your chance of getting more auditions. And of course, more auditions give you the opportunity to get hired more. Mm. And when I'm talking about hurdles, uh, certainly connectivity, that I can get to your professional studio uh, in a way that we can hook you up with our studio, that helps. Uh, Certainly a high-end quality home studio setup, not just an audition setup, Mm. but a, a studio at home where you can produce out of. Uh, that has a consistent sound that I know I can come back to and offer to my clients that whether it's Jamie or someone else, they're like, hey, this guy or this woman's room is going to sound the same every time. There's a functionality that is easy to work with. Mm. Uh, And then uh, your points of, yes, if I send you auditions, it's important that you get them back to us on time. Mm. Uh, Any sort of, it's important in any business to show consistency in how you act as a professional. So those are the things we are looking for. Yeah, and... Is it fair to say that you're, you know, you've got a long memory if, you know, you work with someone and, you know, maybe they're a bit difficult to work with or they take a while to send you files, stuff like that, and that will hurt your chances of getting work in the future? Yeah, I think so. Anything that, any difficulty that people have in the process, and there are a lot of steps in the voiceover process from audition, casting and auditions right through to final delivery of uh, your audio files, there Mm. are many small steps and every one of those steps is important to me as a producer. So the more that you as a talent can do it correctly every time, every step, that raises your profile in my mind. Right. So then the follow-up question for that would probably logically be, if you jump in too early into this industry, if you reach out and overextend yourself, you know, you can't deliver on some of these things, that may actually be detrimental to your future career. Right. There's a potential. There's that potential. But obviously, we do have to say, get started. You know, you do have to just get going. And 
I think if you're straight up about, hey, this is where I'm at in my career right now. I've had this much coaching. I've had this much one, two, three years of experience. At the moment, I know my home studio is perfect for auditions. However, it's not perfect for production. Mm. And if you want to hire me, uh, please consider that whatever area I'm in, you're either going to have to bring me to a studio locally or, mm. you know, if you insist, I'll come to your studio. Right. And the, the more you're straight up with your capabilities, it's easier for us as producers to decide, are we going to include you in this project or are we going to maybe wait for the next time for you? Yeah. And is this fair to say that when you're choosing someone, it comes down to two or three people, say, for a project and you have to mm -hmm. pick the person that's going to go through is it more of a gut thing as to who you go with or are you looking at it more sort of mathematically and a bit more pragmatically? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, there are times when we make the final decision. I do trust myself. What I always say to people is, uh, for me, it's sort of like a chord. I just hear a voice uh, compared to voice one, voice two, voice three, voice four. And there's just something about one of those four voices in this circumstance mm -hmm. that just hits a chord for me. And yeah. I trust myself as a professional. I've been in the business a long time. I understand my client, what he or she may be looking for. And so I trust myself that like voice two, that's what they want. But there are other moments when we're casting and now we're going to send a variety of voices to our client. Say we're going to send just uh, before we got on the air here, air here, we were sending six voices to a political client who was looking for a candidate running in upstate New York. They wanted uh, middle-aged women, and so we have a concept of what that means. Mm. And uh, I know that client very well, so I kind of understand what he, where he's coming from. He's looking for a woman that has a little more depth in her voice, a little more maturity. The spot's probably going to be a little more serious. I haven't seen the copy yet, but that's what I'm envisioning. Yeah. So we're casting along those lines, and we send him five or six women who are, four of the women are very exact to that spec. And then there are two women who are probably a little lighter and maybe a little younger, just in mm -hmm. case he or she or their client says like, hey, let's pull it back a little bit. So we, we include a little variety. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. That's really interesting to sort of peek behind the curtain there a little bit and mm -hmm. see, see how you work. And I think it's probably worth pointing out that, you know, a lot of voice actors, actors in general, actually, um, particularly when they start a kind of a bag of neuroses, <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, paranoid about every little thing. And you right. know, if you don't get hired for the first hundred auditions that you put yourself out for, yeah, it's like, it can be... What's wrong with me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but really, it could just be that you're, you know, not right for that part. Um, and, you know, that that's not necessarily, you're not choosing people based on, it's just this linear scale of bad to good. Yes. And there's so many voices. There's so many choices. Mm. So then slowly, like we talked about just a little earlier the more things you can bring into your act that help us find you and like you and return to you, mm. uh, the, the, you raise your chances of getting more scripts. And as you get more scripts, certainly you improve your ability to book because uh, there's a big part about the industry right now that has to do with getting scripts. You want to make connections that you get scripts. Without scripts, nothing happens. So, yeah. so whether it's from, from a talent side, receiving scripts from me or from my side as a someone who casts and produces, receiving scripts from my clients. So I'm trying to do many, many things in my little world of my studio, my understanding of the industry, to get my clients to consistently give us, us scripts. Right. And it's interesting that when we listen back to episode 19, um, that was the episode that we did where we were listening to auditions. people auditioning exactly for mm -hmm. the Fresh Feast thing. So if you haven't listened to this, I would go back and listen to episode 19. And Jim's basically casting while we listen. <laughs> and it's really, really right. interesting to hear it's your, a good, it's your a, reaction. It was a good show. Yeah, it was a fun ex It was a very good exercise. Yeah, so many people say that they, they enjoyed listening to that episode and it was so eye-opening. Mm -hmm. We tried, you know, obviously we wanted it to be real and... I think it came. It comes across. It was real. Yeah. And what was interesting to me particularly was that you weren't necessarily, you know, the specs were there and you take the specs in and you sort of absorb them and they go into the sort of melting pot of your brain. Mm -hmm. And then you listen to the auditions almost separately from that. And, and in some ways you take all the, the requirements from the specs, but you have to do a certain amount of creative processing in your brain to know you know, what the client is eventually looking for. And some of those auditions weren't straight up 
the obvious choice. There was one or two that had a bit of a quirky element to them and really made them jump out above the rest. Mm -hmm. So how much are you looking for something to just um, spark your interest? Right. Well, I think we always are. Whenever we open up any file and start to listen to a talent's audition, their work, uh, we're hoping to be impressed. We're hoping Mm -hmm. to be blown away. Uh, Very often we listen to something and it's like, "Ah, not quite right for this client, but in my mind I'm thinking that person's right for this client or these other clients, Mm. or I want to use him or her down the road on something else. And very common here in in the studio with Sam, I'll be like, hey, save that person. I want him for that that thing. Uh, It happens all the time. So Mm. even back to your point of, hey, I auditioned 50 times, 75, 100 times, I'm not getting anything. You still have the moment to create an impression on a producer, casting director, a writer. Yeah. Every time you submit. So- Understand that something positive is happening, happening, even if you don't get the job, even if you don't get immediate feedback. You're putting yourself out there, which is a very big part of voiceovers. Yeah, and I think marketing people realize this, that uh, you sort of have to have, I can't remember what, what they call it, something like five touch points or something like that. You have to mm-hmm. make your presence felt four or five times before you're really lodged in someone's brain. Yeah, so every connects. time you, yeah, exactly. So when you yeah. when you do this and submit every time, it just sort of, adds to that now i'm going to get on to some um listener questions in a sec but i have one related question to that maybe sure. we'll get onto this a little bit later but i do want to talk about marketing and we hear a lot about marketing from the perspective of the talent but we don't hear about it a lot from the perspective of the buyer or the producer you know the other end of things so in that case you know how important is a talent's marketing efforts and do they actually translate to you does that trigger something in your brain to make them look more attractive? Or are you seeing someone who, you know, they market themselves as the perfect, like, uh, I don't know, sports caster person or something, and they have a sports right. theme. Does that, you do you think that helps lodge that idea in your mind that when you get a sports casting project come in, they're the person to go to? Or do you think it's something else? Yeah, if someone says I'm the medical narration champion of uh, Slovakia, something yeah. like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I know websites are important. They, uh, they're they like your calling card, but uh, mm. you know your graphic package and your website don't mean a lot to me. This is just to me. Uh, mm. It's important that you have it. And when I go to your website, I want to be able to download your demos uh, quickly. I want to be mm. able to contact you right away in a way that I know you're going to answer back to me. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, mm. I always say to people, uh, I don't mind you reaching out to me. I know you're just trying to be successful. Certainly, I come to work every day to be successful, so I don't begrudge anybody that sending me an email saying, like, um, I just got an email earlier today from a fellow that down in North Carolina. We had worked with him for a while, I know. We had sent him a bunch of scripts, and I liked his work. We never hired him, but I liked his work. And mm. then somehow he just fell out of the loop. You know, He was still working. He's still involved in the business. But he sent me an email saying, like, hey, don't forget about me. I'm still here. And right away, I sent him an email back saying, like, I understand. You you know, you kind of fell out of the loop, but I'm going to send you an audition copy, and thanks for reaching out to me. Yeah. So that little bit of marketing that he did, uh, you know, it worked. He may, he may have sent out 25 emails today. But uh, yeah. even if you just get one guy to send you a script, that's what it's all about. So fancy marketing and, like, newsletters. I'm not, you know, I love you, but I'm not going to read your newsletter. Uh, yeah. I may quickly look at it because you're in a play or something, so uh, you, you're telling me something. But most producers, most directors, most creative people don't have a lot of time to spend uh, mm. checking out your backstory. Uh, I'll take a quick look, get the information I need, and then you know, if I want to send you a copy, I'll do it right away. Yeah, It's the relationship that starts when I start sending you a copy that I'm really judging you on. The mm. fact that you have... Uh, you know, a, a 3D website doesn't mean anything to me <laughs> if the auditions aren't happening the way I want them to. Yeah, yeah. And you have to really be respectful of people's time if you're harassing them over email. That's just going to be counterproductive. It's just going to make you an right. annoyance. And I think when you get to that level too, depending on who you're reaching out to, you really have to have the goods. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. you know, if you say like, hey, I want to work with you. I'd love to be represented uh, by you guys and have you send me scripts. And then I'm like, okay, send me your demos. And you're like, well, I haven't really made my demo yet. And then it's like, well, forget it. You know, what's the point? Yeah. Okay, great. 
I, that was a bit of the sort of casting chat. So I want to get into some questions <laughs> from the audience here. And then we're going to get yeah. after that into the production side. All right. So speaking of which, Clarence Searles says, I'm just getting started. And while I'm looking for coaching, I would like to start practicing. What do you think would be the first things to begin working on? Uh, it's a good question, Clarence, of course. Uh, you could go to... Uh like magazines or some sort of written text and just find some copy that you can read out loud. It's very important that you read out loud every day a number of times during the day. Mm -hmm. I would also suggest, you know, listening to advertising in whether you are a 50-year-old guy or a 25-year-old guy, wherever you are at, look for uh, spots where they're using talents like, like your age group, your demographic, and listen to the attack that those people are being directed in. And I think you should try to not mimic that attack, but make that a part of the, what your career could be, you know, like the, you have to follow the trends of the industry. Yeah. And it sounds like based on what you were saying earlier, um, it's not just the acting side, but you know, there's the business side and there's the technology side. You've also got mm -hmm. to absorb all that as well. That's, it's quite an uphill right. battle, you know? Yes, it is. there's a lot to, you know, it, the career has changed over the years from uh, the eighties when I started the career of a voiceover actor has changed dramatically in mm. that you have to wear many hats and there's no way out of that now, especially as we move forward into 2020 and beyond. You have to have technical skills. You need marketing skills. You really are a freelancer. So mm. besides the acting talent through coaching, through experience of working on mic, you have to add in, I'm a marketer. You have to add in, I'm a technician. Uh, it's still an exciting job. It's a fun job. But there are more parts to it than just, I have an agent, and my agent sent me out, and I read copy. Mm. That voiceover career has come to an end. Yeah. So how long do you think, then, is is there an average of how long it takes to get ready to start reaching out to people, or is it purely situational dependent? Uh, I think it, it is situational dependent, but I think it takes a couple of years. It takes two, three, four years to really get your, your yourself up to speed. Mm. Uh in that you're really going to compete on uh, national level spots or regional level spots or get the attention of an agent. Uh, yeah. But that's not always the case either because you could go to Barnard and study acting or you could go up at Yale and study acting and right. these people come out and, yeah, they're ready to go. Uh, they're probably not ready to go as marketers or as technicians, but mm -hmm. they're ready to go dramatically. Uh, so there are some you know, quicker ways into the industry too, but not everybody has those opportunities and um, what's your take on working for free or working cheaply to you know build your skills to build your skills i think it's a good idea certainly uh you know i worked at a recording studio for two years in the really early 1980s and you know i think i made like two thousand dollars in a year uh, yeah. and that was just like they gave me like threw me a bone every now and again <laughs> so that was how i got into the industry you know i just said like hey i understand audio and uh, I'm more than happy to just hang out here all day long. So yeah. uh, that's a way into any career. Uh, but obviously you can't just give away free voiceovers forever either. But, uh, you know, I guess there's a moment yeah. of it. It's, it's, you know, it's nice to be a team player, you know. That, that can never go away. It, throughout your career, no matter how big you get, you've never really arrived. You always have to be a team player. You always have to be proving yourself every session. Mm. I think from my perspective as a talent, there's, you know, there's not just the skills element that you have to overcome, but also the, the, the self-critical aspects and the confidence, things like that. So you don't necessarily always get that from winning time and time again. Sometimes you get right. confidence from, you know, keep plugging away despite all the setbacks and things like that. Right. So it was for me personally, it was a a very gradual process. I was lucky because I had the engineering side down because mm -hmm. I'd been working in studios, but the performance and the business and just the general confidence in its own right takes a long time. Yeah, it takes um, time. Yeah, and you have to have, and confidence is really key, I think, for booking a lot of gigs and you know performing in the sessions because if you're a bag of nerves, you're not going to perform at your best and you're not going to look very professional. Right, it, comes, it does come across. People can hear it, but... Well, we always mm. say to the talents when we hire them, when we bring them in, or we send even when we send them copies, like, I always say, hey, you deserve your success. You belong here. It's the reason yeah. why you're here. 
uh, and you should believe it, you know, because like you just said, people come in sometimes and they're like, well, I'm not sure why you picked me. Da, da, da. And it's like, no, man, hey, you deserve your success. You've been working really hard. You can do this. You're going to be great. Uh, we had a, six different talents in here this morning before this session started. And every one of them, as I mic them and went back to, my, to get behind the board, I said like, hey, you belong here. You're going to be great. That's what I, you yeah. know, and, I, and I really mean it. So what do you think when, when someone comes in and they're super underconfident? Is, does, that, does that drop your confidence in, does your expectation go down? <laughs> no, I don't, at least I don't. You know, I, I understand, you know, it's not an easy gig. It's a hard career. And so at Lotus Productions, we work really hard to support people and grow our relationships mm. with the talents and try to make them feel comfortable here. Because uh, I say this also all the time. Everybody has microphones. Everybody has wires and cables. There's plenty of technicians in the world. What makes my company successful for so long is our relationships with the talents. Yeah. We get to know the talent. We try to help them grow as, you know, we're interested in their own lives. We're interested in their lives. And mm. We're trying to help them grow their lives by hiring them, helping them become more successful, uh, recommending them to other producers, uh, getting them more exposure in the type of voiceover projects they do for us because it's it's all about teamwork it's about sticking together yeah and that is definitely a differentiating factor between you and a lot of other production houses and you know casting places that you have that really encouraging spirit you know in as part of your process no, um, that's just not that's us that's who we yeah are. yeah it's not as common as you'd like you think <laughs> <laughs> so uh you definitely you know doing the doing all that prep work and you know i've been in sessions where the director or producer or whatever is just seemingly out to get you <laughs> Boo. Uh, yeah Boo. <laughs> i won't n mention any names but there's one guy in new york who i refuse to work with but anyway <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah um building that confidence and building that sort of uh sort of grit you know takes time in its in its own right um okay this is a very straightforward one and this is interesting John Harrison Masamba asks, how do you determine what to charge? Simple question. Uh, that's a very good question, John. <laughs> yeah, it is. From like a talent point of view, if say someone reaches out to you, John, and says like, hi, I've got uh, 500 words, uh, what would you charge me? Or this is just one page, it's half a page, and it's going to be on my website. Uh, one of the questions that whether you're a top of the line talent agent in one of the big shops here in New York or LA or around the world, one of the questions that the agents always ask us is, hey, what's in your budget? Mm. You should never be afraid to ask that question to your client before you kind of kick out a number. Just say like, oh, what do you have in mind? What's in your budget? Yeah. And I think, you know, obviously we do that in our negotiations too. It's, it's a, a negotiation. It's not an end of the world negotiation when you're talking about voiceover rates. But in a non-union world, you have to quote yourself out all the time. Mm. And so starting with that question, I think is great, John. Just say like, uh, hey, what do you have in your budget in mind? And then he or she may say $75 or they might say $750. And then when you start to think about rates in a long view, like your whole career, you're trying to, again, create a relationship with this person. So mm. you certainly don't want to just rip them off once and say goodbye. Mm. Uh, that's a style. It's certainly not my style as a producer. Yeah. Uh, we really, from the beginning, we've always thought about, let's do multiple, multiple jobs with people, grow a relationship with them, because the producer who has one little voiceover for a web page in 2018 may go on to be a very positive, very powerful producer in two, three, four years. Yeah. And that then that person will remember you and say, like, hey, my budgets are much better now. I have, these people are giving me $2,000 a show. So let me kick back and I'll give you seven fifty for this show. Mm. Uh, I do believe that happens in our business all the time, and that's how we structure our rates. Yeah, long term relationships. And so, are prices on your website as a voice talent a, a major no no? You think then? Yeah, I think it takes the fun out of it <laughs> if you put <laughs> the numbers up. Uh, that's true. Then you, there's the, uh, it's a much bigger conversation, but. Uh, there are a lot of younger producers now who are very buttoned down and very specific about rates. It's like the, mm. they almost forget the creative side, and they're just talking about rates and hours and per word. And they kind of move away from the organic thing that we're actually doing here in voiceovers, in voiceovers that we're 
trying to create something very interesting. We're trying to communicate important ideas one to another. And if you get buttoned down in the caught in all the facts of the rates and words and time, you lose the creative edge. So trying to be over specific or like overly committed to your rates, I think is kind of a dead end. And rates is a whole other podcast that we're going to get into in a few weeks time. Um, But it's, it's very hard if you're coming into the industry, say you were working a retail job and you're getting, you know, 10 bucks an hour, Mm -hmm. knocking a voiceover out in 10 minutes for $75 seems sounds like great. a no-brainer. Yeah. Sounds great. I mean, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. But then you're also not doing that eight hours a day, five days a week. You know, you, you've got no guarantee and you've had to invest money and in your yeah. equipment and your training and you've got to pay your own health insurance yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Right. Rates are a very important question. Obviously, people talk about them all the time and it is worthy of a much longer conversation um, mm. but because there are a lot of things to factor into just as you're starting to point to, point out to, like you've invested in your career, you've invested in coaching lessons, equipment, uh, your time, you're giving out your time to audition, uh, you know, hours and hours and hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you do have, in the moment when you do, are working and you are being paid, you have to be compensated fairly. And I think from the producer director side, creative director side, writer side, all of us understand that without talent, we can't get anywhere. You know, we need talent. So we have to pay you a fair rate. We have to make it possible for you to have a life that you're available to us. And that it's not just like, well, I can help you, but when my job is over around 7.30 at night, I can do a voiceover recording for you. Right, yeah. That may be the reality of some talents uh, in going forward in the next few years. But obviously, the more from my side as a producer through my clients, I can get you fees that you can have a living, uh, that you can be a professional voiceover talent it helps make more and more talents available to us. Yeah, and I know someone who was speaking the other day and they work for a certain radio organization that is having troubles right now. (laughs) And uh, they work as a sort of hourly wage, you know, and within that they they have to do uh, projects for that radio station. And what they get paid a week would be one gig in voiceover. Yeah, You know, you have to book one gig in voiceover and you can justify doing that, but of course... It's a leap, you know, going from this consistent wage right. to, you know, committing and being available 24-7 so you can work with people like you. Um, right. It's a leap. Now, John, if you want to get a sense of rates in this industry, um, a really great resource is the Global Voice Acting Academy. They have a website. I think it's GVAA. Right. Uh, let me wait. Let me just check. Let me find out the proper address. Yeah, that, it's a great uh, starting point when it comes to rates. They have high, middle, and low options for you. Uh, They break down a lot of categories, obviously, in the voiceover business. There are many, many voiceover categories. Uh, Some of them overlap. Uh, Obviously, you could be making a TV voiceover that's going to be on, uh, say, a 30-second, almost like a spot. They're not going to buy any airtime. You know, it's not going to be on the late show, but the spot's going to be on a website. The spot's going to be used in cable regionally, say, throughout the state of uh, Texas. So you have to combine rates and come up with a final fee. And their chart is very well thought out. And uh, to me, that chart's very sellable, like when you talk to your clients. I do that all the time, if it's like an e-learning thing or something. Um, the website to go to is globalvoiceacademy.com. And then if you scroll across to the right-hand side under resources, you click on GVAA rate guide. And it's good because it's got the union and non-union rates as well. And it's, I believe, constantly being updated. Um, so that's a really good place. And like you say, if you have a client that quibbles <laughs> a rate that you've put forward mm-hmm. and it's sort of within the ballpark of the GVAA, you can send them to that website and say, look, this is a fairly well uh, respected organization that has put this rate card up that a lot of voice talents ascribe to. So um right. I would definitely I recommend think many, looking at that. Many producers are aware of it too now. Right. So uh, you have producers who are. You know, one thing you have to take into account, John, or any of the other talents, is that younger producers are learning too. Uh, mm. Younger talents are learning. Younger producers are learning. So they're also learning how to quote out jobs. Uh, so many times they might make a mistake and just be like, "Well, I thought maybe four hundred dollars would be good." But in reality, that job should be eight hundred dollars. Mm. So either you could compromise in the seven fifty, seven hundred range, or maybe you, by giving them, the, by giving that young producer some information like that chart, uh, he or she might be able to say like, "Oh, I get it now. Yeah, we should quote out eight hundred dollars for this job." 
Mm. And then they can turn around and tell their brand or their producer, their boss, uh, hey, this is why we're paying this much for this, uh, this project with this talent. Yeah. So it, there's a little explaining. You know, it, is, it isn't always confrontational. There's an no. element to what's going to happen in the future of voiceovers where we just have to share information together uh, right, at, right up front. Don't be uncomfortable about it. It's still business. And once you get that business out of the way, then you can get back to the part I was talking about, the fun part, which is now we're going to be creative. Now we're going to share our best ideas one to another. And all that work I've put in as a talent to get better and better all the time is going to come right into your project. That's what the producer wants. Right. Fantastic. So, okay, well, that this seems like a perfect point now to talk about the production side mm-hmm. and how you work with talents when they come into you. I want to talk about some of the dynamics between the talent behind the mic and you as the person the other side of the glass, because I think that's a really interesting discussion. And, you know, we see it sometimes there's videos on YouTube of people working, but that dynamic between the talent and the producer is something that is that takes some time to cultivate i think that confidence um Mm -hmm. so what's what's the vibe that you enjoy working in that environment um what do you try and foster right when people when we're meeting people for the first time uh, yeah when you're working with them right we're we always try to make it fun we're trying to make it relaxed uh we're trying to help the talent really get into themselves and just be themselves on mic. Mm. Obviously, voiceover for the last few years has all been about conversational reads. Uh, Certainly, as we head forward in voiceovers, everything's going to be about conversational, particularly when we start to talk about uh, robot-to-human conversations, the Alexas, the Google Homes. That conversational movement in voiceovers is just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. So as we keep that in mind... We're trying to get to know the talent, understand who they are, you know, you know, be friendly, uh, get them relaxed when I first bring them in. And that's why I mic everybody, have them come in. Do you, do you want to sit? you want to stand? You know, get, get in a position. Can you see you all right? And then like, okay, let's read a little bit and let's kind of loosen it up. And then at that point, after we've kind of loosened up and set a few levels, then I bring my client in on the phone or, or somehow and he or she, they start to direct and we sort of share direction together. And in our studio, we have a way that we can communicate with the talent uh, and like our client can't hear them. Mm. So (laughs) I can be giving some sort of side notes or like even a note like, hey, what they really mean is this, sort of make it concise. Or I could really give a side note like, hey, they're kind of crazy. Just I think you're doing a good job. Let's stay stay there. Yeah. Uh, So uh, it's all about communication. It's all about like, hey, let's relax. Let's communicate to one another. Uh, Let's bring, you know, be very focused on it. Uh, be very professional about what we're doing, but there still has to be a, you know, one-on-one shared experience. Yeah. And I think there's a sort of, this sort of comfort zone that I gradually cultivated for myself where you're professional, but you're also relaxed, your shoulders are loose and all this kind of stuff. Right. And it sounds like a really, really silly process that I used to go through. I don't do it so much anymore because I don't get quite so nervous. But when I was starting out and I was going into studios and I was going in a lot more when I started because a lot more were in person. But right. I would use the threshold of the building as a kind of imaginary shower that I was walking through. <laughs> and any <laughs> any grime and dirt and stress and worry that was out in the, ba- the the outside world, I would just leave behind. And I'd walk through the front door and then I would be in pro mode, <laughs> Jamie pro mm-hmm. mode, you know. Right. Um, and... I just think having that sort of quiet confidence is such an important part of delivering you at your best. Um, And I know that sounds a bit flowery and a bit sort of waffly, but I mean, I think it it really, really helped me, particularly if there's other stuff going on in your life, which uh, we all have. Yeah, people, I think that's a good idea. I think it's, you know, a a good, you know, mental click. There are things that I I think everybody uses. Mm. Uh, There's an element of combining being relaxed and positive. Mm. But also being very focused, you know, it's it's yeah. important to be uh, listening. Like in in the voiceover business, listening is very important. Yeah, uh, talent have to listen to directors. I have to listen to directors, and you're constantly trying to understand what they're trying to tell you, mm. so you can experiment and work on mic with them. So there is a you have to be focused. It's not just like particularly as a sidebar, like a pet peeve. If someone's too jokey and like their mind's running all over the place. Yeah. To me, that's like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you're getting paid to be here. This is work. 
you know, it's still work, even though we're relaxed and calm about it. You know, when you come and you're in front of the mic for me, you're here to work. And so there has to be a real professional element built into the idea that uh, it's okay to have a sense of humor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, picking up on Clarence's question a little bit when he was asking about what, what you can do to get started, I would also practice working with a stopwatch because particularly on commercial, mm -hmm. you have a lot of timing elements that you have to adhere to. So it get it's quite handy. You know, say time yourself doing a read um, couple of sentences with a stopwatch and then say, right, I need to shave off five seconds. Mm -hmm. So time yourself again, imagining what five seconds would be and then look at how much you actually did shave off. Because being able to just speed something up by three or four seconds or half a second or whatever that can really, really give you a competitive advantage in the studio because you get that feedback a lot. Speed up, slow right. down, whatever it is. You know. Yeah, that's what uh, the many, many directors are going to give you that, that information. It's like, hey, I, I only have 3.4 seconds for this line. We already did the edit. It's all set. It's got to be 3.4. Yeah. And they're like, and my client won't let me cut anything. So you have to be able to pick up the time. And, <laughs> and if you can't hit it for time, if you, if you come in at like 4.8, 4.8, 4.8, 4.8, over and over and over again, it's like, What's going on? Yeah. Here? Like, <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, this speaks to taking direction, actually. And that was my next question um, before we have a, one or two more and then we can wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, taking direction is a skill in its own right, I think. And it's something that is not really um, talked about as much as it should should be, I think. So how much are you looking for someone who can take direction? Because they're not necessarily going to walk in the booth and just get the tone right immediately. But if they're craftable, you know, mm -hmm. you know you can get out of them what you need. So presumably that's a really important skill to have. Yeah, I'd agree. That's a very important skill, particularly as we grow our relationship with talents. There are moments where I'll be like, eh, you know, it's tough to get him out of that one read, so let's not recommend him for this job. But mm. on the other side, there are other talents who are like, uh, she's really flexible, she gets direction well, let's definitely submit her. Uh, li di taking direction has to do with listening. Obviously, we all communicate differently. Mm. Uh, and so you have to try to understand what the writer, he or she is telling you. Pay attention, listen. It's perfectly all right to ask questions. Uh, it's okay to ask a question or two and then, hey, let me dive in. Let me try something. Of course, be open to the notes that come back to you. And uh, again, as you do more and more sessions, you get better at taking notes, you know, just like any any acting skill. Yeah. It is a big key to who gets to be more successful, you know, that, that they can right. take direction well, that they follow along, that they uh, can get back to a point. I think a very impressive thing for me as someone who's not a talent to be able to say to them, hey, let's go back like four or five takes ago and that voice was better mm. and I'd rather have you do that. And somehow the top people, they remember that take for four or five, to, you know, reads ago. Yeah. Obviously, we could always play it back to them and say, hey, this is what we liked. Let's do a variation on this theme by just making it a little brighter. You know, that, that's a very typical direction. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's a skill on, on my side, too. When I work with younger producers who come to the session, you know, I let them take the lead. But slowly, I'm also trying to tell them, like, there is a way that you communicate with actors. And why don't you try saying this or give them this note mm. and see how they react to it. And so, again, on the producer-director side... Younger producer directors are also learning how to communicate with talent, uh, how we talk in this business. Because, you know, there's a language in the voiceover business, just like every business. Yeah. And so, you know, at Lotus Productions, we're also involved in that, working with, uh, we do a lot of work with Vayner Media, very popular shop right now. And uh, Vayner has wonderfully brilliant directors. Yeah. But many of them haven't had a lot of experience in a voiceover situation. So they come in, they have great clients, they know what they want, they've cast excellent talent. But now they have to communicate their ideas to the talent. So we try to help them understand the way that this business works on that level, on the direction level. Right. So if you if you don't necessarily work with a producer or that much, would you say that maybe meeting up with local voice talents or something like that, you could help direct each other? That that would be a good way of practicing receiving direction? Yeah, I think that's a good way. I'm a big fan on like uh, getting with coaches, getting with other talents, and uh, mm. because... Uh, some person might have a little more experience than you and they got this direction and never in a way that like, oh, I got this crazy direction. I didn't know what to do. Don't look at it that way. It took like, hey, there are notes that are good. There are notes that are bad. And this is what happened or this is what someone said. And 
the more directors that you're getting information from, you know, one at a time, uh, you're growing, you're getting better at it. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's really just experience. There's a big element of success in the voiceover business that does come with experience. So by getting in a situation where there's eight or 10 other talents and people take turns directing, whatever, and you get different voices in your head, I think that can be very positive. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to ask you a question about Vayner in a minute, but, uh, before we get there, that'll be the final question. Before we get there, I want to have one more question. Now, this is too directed to talent, I think, but I, I'm interested to hear your take on this as well. Tommy Robert Rickett, he asks, about how much time do you spend in the booth recording and or auditioning versus marketing yourself? So we touched on this earlier, the importance of marketing or the importance of actually working. So, you know, what's your take on that? Well, it's a good question, of course, Tommy. Uh, there's no sense marketing yourself if you don't have any talent. <laughs> yeah. I think that was my first reaction. Uh, you got to, you know, obviously, they there are plenty of products that they sell on TV that stink. <laughs> they just yep. have good advertising behind them. But uh, I think you should spend more time in the booth, working on your reads, getting coaching, and then the marketing part will have more effect. Obviously, if you have a better product, uh, that would yeah. be my quick answer. And then you also know how and what to market because you don't necessarily know what right. your USP is when you're starting out, yeah. of course. Uh, in, in the course of starting out, I would first put into my skills working with coaching, growing my talents as a voiceover actor, and then I would do te technology second before I would do marketing. I'd put marketing mm. third. I would, you definitely have to understand how uh, you know, recording software works, how microphones work, how you deliver audio files. These things have to be figured out right away. Otherwise, yeah. you never get to the marketing. Right. Okay, great. Now, my final question. We're both fans of Gary Vaynerchuk, and you work with VaynerMedia a lot. I know we've worked together on a Vayner project, I think, or two. Mm -hmm. um, now, he talks about documenting versus creating, the power of helping people, altruism, all that kind of stuff. So, And I would definitely recommend people follow him on YouTube and Twitter and things. How much do you think this sort of new business approach really impacts the voiceover industry. Do you think it's as relevant for us as it is to maybe other industries? Of course, I know the voiceover industry, so I'll say I think it has a lot of relevance, particularly mm. as we move out of uh, move towards 2020. Uh, I, I've talked a lot about teamwork already. Mm. I've talked a lot about helping others already. Uh, I think uh, VaynerMedia has that sort of corporate sensibility. Uh, we, I see it in their employees when they come in. Mm. Uh, they work as teams, they share ideas, not a lot of criticism, not a lot of old school, you know, advertising agency angst, all yep. that's out. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's just driving the most best creative to their clients. Uh, that's what they seem to concentrate on. Yeah. So I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful way for this business to be pointing towards, mm. particularly, like I said, you know, we, I've spent my whole career on human to human communication, making advertising, making spots. Yeah. But now we're totally focused on how we're going to do robot to human communication. We, we talk about voice first and uh, building out Alexa skills. These are the mm. growing voice. This is the growing voiceover market. There's yeah. going to be new rates. There's going to be new platforms. There's going to be new talent involved in this. And that's what I'm excited about. I think you see that excitement from VaynerMedia and Anybody else who's involved in the voice first industry, they know they're going to need voice actors to complete the mission of making relaxed conversational interaction between robots and humans. So I just think it's, it's, there's a great future in this business. Yeah. Well, what a great way to end it. So yeah, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> That's very positive. And Gary talks about it as well in his videos. You hear him talking about voice first all the time. <laughs> so uh, it is very positive for our industry. Right. So uh, yeah future is very bright. I've been tweeting out stand by for action. It's going to be great. Great. Thanks so much, Jim. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jamie. My pleasure too. VO School is uh, fun to be a part of and uh, to be helping you on it is uh, always our pleasure here at Lotus Productions. Okay, there we are. Thank you, Jim, for all of that. That was really, really great. Uh, so much information there. Thank you to everyone for all of your questions. They were really good and got us going on a number of topics. 
and we're done. So join us next week where the tables are going to be turned a little bit on me because I'm going to be answering some questions from the students at Syracuse University. I'm about to record that actually in a couple of hours from now. So let's see how that goes. (laughs) That'll be a fun listen, even if you just want to listen to hear me crash and burn. (laughs) So uh, thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thank you to this week's guests. Our sponsors, J. Michael Collins, IPDTL and Backstage Magazine. Thanks also to Kyle Marie Colucci and Chris Sharps for social media support. Join us next time for another class.